We feel so lucky to actually even be able to entice Trenton Grail Hancock to the Ulrich and to Wichita. Among his many claims to fame, when Doyle Hancock first exhibited in the Whitney Biennial, that made him the youngest artist to ever have been included in that prestigious exhibition. If I've done my math right, he was 24 years old at the time. And it was also in that year um, that he received his MFA degree. So, you know, straight out of school or kind of during the last of school, and there he is at the Whitney. I wouldn't call that leapfrogging in one's career. I'd call that skyrocketing, and maybe the rest of you would agree with me. At any rate, deservedly so. Uh, Doyle Hancock has fashioned a very original form of both myth-making and storytelling in the visual arts, and he's done so at a moment when unusual, imaginative, non-linear narrative has really um, come to the fore, uh, been on the rise, so he's very, his work is very of the moment. And he's an artist that now is decorated with honors. He's the recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Fellowship, and as well, the Studio Museum in Harlem gave him their prestigious Ween Fellowship, among others that I'm, I'm not gonna stand here and, and count off for you. He's received two major public art commissions. The Seattle Art Museum had him do something for them in their just gorgeous uh, Olympic sculpture park. And the Dallas Cowboys football station, uh, stadium rather, also commissioned him. He has exhibited all over the globe at this point, from Singapore to Edinburgh to Warsaw and shown in most major cities here in the United States. The one that really warmed my heart was Paris, Texas. He and I were just talking about this before. That's um, it really where um, he grew up. So um, from, um, you know, from the heart of Texas, really, clearly you, you understand well, I could go on and on introducing um, this artist. And I'll stop right here. Please help me to welcome Trenton Doyle Hancock, both to Wichita and to the stage. Mm. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's good to be here. Um, and what a blessing to hear that choir. That was amazing. Um, yes, this is my first time in Wichita. It's a very nice place. A little wet, but... Uh, <laughs> That's fine with me. Um, let's see what's up there. Well, I usually start these, these uh, lectures with a quote from my favorite film, Superman the Movie, from 1978, starring Christopher Reeve and Marlon Brando. Um, there's a, that, that film is important to me for many reasons. But um, I, f I feel as a child, I, I really uh, gravitated to this idea of, of uh, humans doing these things that they weren't supposed to be able to do. This idea of um, gods amongst men somehow. Um, and that, so I looked at sports figures and, um, um, and superheroes for sure. Uh, as examples of this and all other kinds of mythological characters um, were interested, uh, interesting to me. But anyway, this film seemed to exemplify, um, I guess, all that I needed. It seemed to be somewhat of a blueprint for, for life, like a way to, to go through life. Um, and to, once you realize your destiny, um, all the stumbling blocks that you may encounter on the way. Well, anyway, at the beginning of that film, there's uh, well, uh, Superman, who's Superboy at this point, meets his birth father, Jor-El, in what's known as the Fortress of Solitude, which you see before you. And, um, and he is given his mission and his uh, what he's to do in this lifetime. 
um, his responsibility to mankind. Um, so what I'm going to quote for you is his father's address to his son. And Jorel appears before a young Clark Kent, and he, he says, My son, you do not remember me. I am Jorel. I am your father. By now you will have reached your 18th year as it is measured on earth. By that reckoning, I will have been dead for many thousands of your years. The knowledge I have matters physical and historic. I have given you fully on your voyage to your new home. These are important matters to be sure of, but still matters of mere fact. There are many questions to be asked, and it is now time for you to do so. Here in this, this fortress of solitude, we shall try to find the answers together. So my son, speak. Who am I? Your name is Kalel. You're the only survivor of the planet Krypton. And even though you've been raised as a human, you're not one of them. You have great powers, only some of which you have as yet discovered. Come with me now, my son, as we break the bonds of your earthly confinement, traveling through time and space. So this first image I'm going to show you is a piece called Frosty. And I made this in 1996. I guess I was about 20, 22 years old. Um, I was an undergraduate, and I was on this active search to find some kind of image that was, I felt, accurately representative of me, um, something that I could call my own. Um, so I drew and painted nonstop, day and night. Um, and one day I decided, why not just go to the mirror? And the mirror will tell me what I need. So I got a mirror and I painted a very straightforward portrait of, of myself on paper. Um, and it looked like me, sort of, but not really. Uh, so then I found this green tarp in my grandmother's garage and I glued the, um, the portrait to the tarp and then it started to look a little bit more like me and but not enough so then I silk screened over the whole lot of it and started to sand through it and it started to look more like me and finally I, I uh, painted over the rest of it and um, started to um, make the connections between the uh, disparate elements of the, of the work. And finally, I felt it was engaging enough and rich enough and had enough history to at least feel like me. So you'll see, um, and I'll talk about a little bit more about these things as we go on tonight. Um, about how um, identity is revealed to us over time. It's not something that's fixed. Um, it's ever-changing, and we have to be aware when those cues are given to us as to um, when we move along with those changes. And as the artist, I think those, are, those issues are, are of paramount importance. So when I was an undergrad, I had a graduating thesis show, and one of the incarnations of that show was my first one-person show in Dallas, Texas, at the Gerald Peters Gallery. And when people came into the gallery, I think they were expecting to see an artist with a wine glass, wearing a suit, smiling and greeting people, but instead they were faced with this, this wall, this covered in, in felt and fur and draped, sitting in a, in a tall chair, sleeping. Um, I had deprived myself of sleep for about three days and taken sleeping pills in order to not wake up during this performance. But every 30 minutes, an alarm clock would go off, and the director of the gallery would come in, flip on the lights, 
turn off the clock and climb a ladder with a bowl of jello, and she would feed me. The assistant director was underneath the uh, armature, and she was blowing up balloons that corresponded to the color of jello that I had just eaten. Um, there was um, four different feedings, four different colors of jello, and she would shove the balloons out the butthole of the creature, and by the end of the night, there was balloon shit all over the floor. <laughs> and here's an image um, of the residue from that performance, what's left over. Um, and on the walls are plastic tops. These are things that I've been collecting ever since I was um, about two or three years old. Um, what I would do is I would go around the house and open up all the cabinets and unscrew all of the detergent bottles or, or what have you, and I would use these as, and mix them in with my toys because they were the same relative size and color and shape um, material as my toys. So I, I doubled my toy collection um, by doing this. Drove my mother crazy, but um, it made sense to me somehow this was a truth like these things I equated uh, with sculpture, with toys, with um, something important, and with beauty. I knew back then even that these things were beautiful. And here, um, and at this phase in the game, I was just trying to figure out a vocabulary for myself, uh, things that I could trust and believe in. In fact, um, when I would do performances, it was as, as if something was calling me to do these performances um, as a way to um, gain some kind of confidence in the characters that I was painting. So I became that creature because that's something that had emerged from my paintings, but I didn't trust it. So in, to perform it is to trust it, is to believe it, is to not be... <clears throat> Um, a fraud. I think it's okay for an artist to be a liar, but it's in inexcusable for an artist to be a fraud. Um, so these, I felt, were truthful. Gluing plastic tops onto this canvas and trusting that it was emotive enough to be an abstraction, something that I could endorse. So I signed my name to it at the bottom. And actually, I carved my name in the bottom a more violent act of signing. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the first mounds that I ever made two-dimensionally. Uh, it's felt and fur and acrylic on paper. This is one of the first mounds that I ever made on canvas, and it's a malformed mound, and it's called um, the Babiever, and the title of it is When I Saw Her Face now I'm a beaver. This is an egromaniac five times fast. Coon Bear the Legend Jr. He'll pop up later. You'll see him a lot. And these are vegans. And there may not be any vegans in Kansas. I don't know, but... <clears throat> Coming from Texas and moving to Philadelphia, where I went to graduate school, I, I had never met one of these characters before. And <clears throat> everybody eats meat down there, but I was sort of thrust into a roommate situation with um, a husband and wife who were, who were vegan. They were lovely people, but uh, a little hard to live with um, and kind of preachy. They started to get on my nerves after a while. <clears throat> so the only way I knew to get back at them was to make horrible, horrible drawings of them. <laughs> and it made me feel a lot better about myself. <clears throat> so this is me sitting at the dinner table having some vegans for dinner. Um, it's called salad. <laughs> so when a bunch of vegans get together, that grouping is called a salad. So. And here, and after I graduated, I continued to draw these characters. But the more I drew them, I began to strip 
their humanity away from them, and they became more um, insect-like, more um, goblin-esque. Um, they had bones protruding in, from places where bones shouldn't be, and they started to lose their hair, and they shrank, and they um, were bound to very dark and cold places. And I don't know who that guy is. But anyway, when I was <clears throat> in the fourth grade, I created this character called Torpedo Boy. And Torpedo Boy was me. Um, and I would, you know, turn into him. And um, I don't know, I had just gotten glasses and my self-esteem was, you know, pretty low. But I, you know, I had this gift. Uh, I could you know, write and then illustrate these writings and then escape into these worlds where um, I could then, I had agency and I could do anything that I wanted to do. And um, after a while, those worlds became more real to me sometimes than the outside world. Um, and I stopped drawing Torpedo Boy probably after about the sixth or seventh grade. And, but he came back when I was an undergraduate, when I, like I said before, I went through this search. I was like trying, digging deep within me to find uh, something that I felt was mine. And luckily I had saved all my drawings from childhood, so I started to um, go through these, these bags and bags of drawings at home and up popped Torpedo Boy. So I revived him. And when he came back, he, uh, he was more grown up. Uh, he had the residue of life on his costume, and he, um, how would I say, he succumbed to the pleasures of the flesh sometimes, and his ego sometimes would get the better of him. In some ways, I equate Torpedo Boy now with um, the artist and the kinds of issues that the artist is con constantly confronted with. <clears throat> this is a piece called Leave Salem, where Torpedo Boy is stepping on someone's face. <clears throat> this is Torpedo Boy kills shoplifters, so don't shoplift. <laughs> and here we have, um, this is one of a series of ten drawings that um, tell a story about Torpedo Boy going into the sewer and um, stealing tofu from vegans. It, <coughs> and he takes the stolen tofu and ducks into an alleyway where he sees a young prostitute named Trudy Fluso and he uses this, this tofu to um, purchase a prostitute. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, it's sad, I know. <coughs> But yeah, I wanted to flesh out this, this Torpedo Boy's character. He's kind of um, represents, I don't know, just getting to the very bottom of stuff and, you know, raking up the nastiest of the muck. And he's kind of uh, the uh, broadcaster of these things. Um, I try to hit every facet of my psyche in these works, as you will see. And here's a work called, Wow, That's Me. This is about six by nine feet. It's acrylic on canvas. I did it in graduate school. And this is one of the first pieces that I actually carved into the surface of the work. Uh, so the letters, Wow, That's Me, are actually embedded in the surface. And um, I had been building these characters. I didn't know that they were called mounds just yet. I'd been performing them and painting them and I, I started to ask myself questions like, what would a mound look like on the inside? So this was sort of a, um, an articulation of that landscape. It was like, oh, well, that's a viable thing for me to paint. Like, that's worthy material. So if I'm digging inside myself, why wouldn't this character who's also me do the same thing? And what would that look like? So those questions begat other questions, begat other questions, so on and so forth. Um, and I came to know this kind of um, 
format as a mound meet because it, it was like, it looked like the meeting of many mounds, but it was also the meat that's inside of mounds. And I would also just draw or, and paint these when I would get bored. You know, it's just some, it's a way for me to experiment with lots of different compositional ideas. I'll talk a little bit about wall drawing, or what I like to call the extended field of painting. Uh, at one point, it started to make sense for me to have the paint spill out over the edges of the support onto the wall, uh, therefore creating uh, something environmental. And usually, I'd start with some, some sort of um, module, and that module would then multiply and divide and become this um, larger situation. And this is, I think, yeah, one of the first um, of these kinds of wall drawings. And I'm only in these for scale, but um, so this one is um, in Rotterdam at the uh, Museum Boymans. And this is at the now defunct um, Visionary Art Museum, or Folk Art Museum in New York. And here's, this is uh, Istanbul, at the Istanbul Biennial of 2003. Uh, when they came to me, they, they, they said, so do you need anything for your installation? I said, yes, please bring me a toilet bowl. They're like, excuse me? Yes, a toilet bowl. Uh, set it right in the middle of the floor. I'm like, okay, because, you know, I think people need something to sit on when they're looking at art. <coughs> Most of my ideas come sitting on the toilet, so. <coughs> So now I'm gonna just tell you some stories. And this is sort of the genesis uh, of, of most of my characters. 50,000 years ago, there was an ape man named Homer Buctus. And Homer Buctus wasn't the smartest ape man that ever lived, but he was generally good. And he went out um, every day and he collected food for his family. And he had a beautiful family. He had. Um, an ape wife named Almacroin, <clears throat> and two ape children, Bruthascam and Chromalina. And um, he was a great prov provider for his family. <clears throat> so one day he went out in search for food, and he um, saw something he had never seen before. It was a field full of flowers, and um, they seemed magical, and they were huge, some of them, and they were all different colors, sizes, and shapes, um, and so much abundant beauty that he didn't know what to do, so he began to masturbate in this field of flowers. And he uh, sprinkled his seed, and he went home. And he returned the next day, and his seed had mixed with the flowers, and up sprang these hybrid creatures called mounds, these half-plant and half-human characters. And the flowers begin to speak to Homer Buctus. Homer Buctus, we love you, and we want you to be a loving and caring father for all of your new mound babies. And he, he was overcome with joy. He returned the next day and sprinkled his seed again, and the next day, and the next day. And after a while, he had created um, hundreds upon thousands of these little creatures. And this is a drawing called Fresh Field. It's about, um, I don't know, eight inches by six inches. Graphite on paper. And here we have a four foot by four foot piece called Fresher Field with, um, I counted them as the thousand baby mounds in this work. <coughs> some of them with little heads, some of them with nothing but all small and cute. So from that kind of design, uh, I chose to do uh, a large painting. So this is about, I don't know, six or seven by 10 feet, and it's called Choir, because all of the baby mounds are speaking their first words, which are colors. And this, this piece is heavily collaged, and I'll actually take this moment to try and show, walk you through the process of making one of these things. 
Uh, this is the piece flipped over on its face, um, and I've cut the letters orange, red, or blue, um, or what have you, out of the front of it and reverse applique these fields of color on the back so that shines through. So that provides me with one um, sort of pattern to navigate around or react to. And here we have the piece sort of um, maybe three quarters of the way through uh, where I have not quite articulated the stripes on these creatures, but you can see where they're supposed to sit. Um, so I build these paintings oftentimes with a certain kind of math in mind, um, or um, I do intense amounts of drawings to, uh, to have some kind of blueprint to jump off of. But ultimately the painting uh, is a whole different kind of experience because they're so usually so built up and so tactile. They almost become sculptural. So when the flowers were speaking to Homer Buckus, we love you, we love you, we love you, I thought, how creepy is that to have flowers speaking to you? So I wanted to make this, this sort of psychedelic pattern that was like almost you losing your mind. It's like the field, your field of vision is just taken over and there's nowhere to run, there's just words. And then I gave myself the assignment of, huh, if I have this pattern, as you, you can see, um, that I like to use these, uh, lattice works or systems or patterns or what have you. And then it's almost like the idea of the salad. On one level, it's, you know, it's, it's com a comical thing. It's about absurdity, but an another, it's a, it's a formal device. So the mound meat versus the salad versus the way these words or bands sort of weave in and out or lay on top of one another it gives me a vocabulary that I can then use to compose or orchestrate new kinds of images. So anyway, with this particular piece, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if the letters then became the speaker? So what if the letters became flowers? So I made another piece called We Love You. And part of this genesis uh, body of work or um, the garden, if you will, um, I made 52 portraits of these baby mounds. And I arrived at the number 52 by um, naming each one after a letter of the alphabet and going through the alphabet twice. So this is I, 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 et cetera. This is expect sex. And I named this one after one of my favorite horror movies, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, directed by uh, Toby Hooper. Um, and at the beginning of that film, uh, the doomed children um, stumble into a graveyard, and there's an old man um, on the ground hugging a gravestone with one arm and a bottle of whiskey in the other. And he looks up at the, the doomed children, and he says, I see things. So the name of this piece is, I See Things. And this is um, mound number one, the legend. And I was, um, around that same time, offered an opportunity to make wallpaper. So I took this drawing and several other drawings of this field of flowers, or this Garden of Eden, and um, found a wallpaper designer, and we, made this repeat. And so um, I turned the gallery sort of into this makeshift domestic, um, like large living room uh, that seemed quite comfortable with its hardwood floor and wallpaper on the wall. But once you got closer to the um, wall, you realized that embedded in the paper, um, in, the, in and amongst the flowers, are severed limbs. And um, of course, each of the mounds although they have very cute aspects, also can be quite grotesque. So there's this pull them in and then grab them kind of aspect to it. So Boothiscam and Chromalina, the two ape children, um, caught wind of what their father had been up to and they discovered this field 
of their ba bastard brothers and sisters. And they were so overcome with anger, hatred, and confusion that they stomped out into this field, wielding tree branches, and they began to beat the life um, out of these, these poor, innocent creatures. Um, and this is another um, suite of wallpaper that I worked on, um, kind of showing the Great Mound Massacre. And baby mounds are rooted in the earth because they're half plants, so they can't get up and run away. Um, so they wobble back and forth. So all these baby mounds wobbling back and forth in fear uh, created an earthquake, and the earth opens up, and it swallows up Bruthus Gam and Chromalina, and they're banished to the lower realm where they're to live out the rest of their days. And while they were down there, they decided to um, one day come back up on top of the earth to get the rest of these mounds and, and, and destroy them. And they procreated. They became husband and wife, and they created a race of inbred beings who were also intent on uh, hating mounds, everything they stood for, which is love and abundance, and everything that they were filled with, which is beautiful meat. And these were the first vegans. So here we have um, a painting. Uh, it's about seven and a half by 11 feet um, called Wow, That's Mean. And here we have the painting on top of the wallpaper. And the paint, um, the wallpaper is printed with black light ink, fluorescent ink, and it's also 3D. So here we have some schmuck looking at the wallpaper. So Homer Buckus realizes that these vegans are going to come back and, and take his, his babies, which, which he loves so much, um, and destroy them. So he uproots them and drags them to different parts of the earth, and he sprinkles seeds around them in hopes that one day thick forests will grow up and protect them from these vegan aggressors. So let's jump about 50,000 years into the future. This is more present day. So here we are in the forest. And here we have a message um, transmitted into the forest called Get Goat. And this transmission is coming from Lloyd, who's this spirit energy who looks over um, my realms. And he's kind of a father type energy. And he's the reason we can read words within my work. And here's a piece called Friends Indeed. And so this transmission or this flash is becoming louder, more intense. And here's the most, the clearest um, of these, these messages. It's called Remember with Membri. Um, and the mound, as he saw this before him, realized what was about to happen. He was, uh, was going to die. Um, this is what we call a death flash. And here it's coming to fruition. The vegans have made their way into the forest via a toilet bowl and are stripping this mound of his beautiful fur and um, stripping him also of his, his meat and collecting it in buckets. This is The Legend is in Trouble. So this is a painting, large painting that I did based upon that small graphite drawing I just showed. Um, and with this work, I wanted the way that it was put together, the way that it was painted with uh, slashing marks and uh, kind of haphazard um, activity to bespeak the content of the work. So conceptually, through and through, I wanted this piece to uh, scream and to bleed. And this is a work called A Yank, A Tug, and A Yank. And these next works are, are building towards a larger work that you'll see. It's a piece called Vegans Do Their Dirtiest Work. And um, these are studies for this work called And the Branches Became as Storm Clouds because 
these vegans are now raining from the branches onto this mound, uh, stabbing them with petrified tofu um, uh, spears. And, um, but this is me attacking the same content from a different angle. So this is essentially the same painting you saw before, uh, relatively the same size, about eight by eight feet. But this time I wanted there to be a certain kind of clarity to it, and I wanted to heighten the sense of absurdity and slapstick. So it's more cartoony, this one, I think. So here you see it in the studio. And here it's in a gallery situation. So Lloyd and the spirit energy that we know as painter, painter is the reason that we can see color within my universe. These two spirit energies have come down to the forest and are about to take away mound number one's soul. And this is called right before the fight before. And here we have painter and Lloyd struggle for soul control. And this is a large canvas work um, in this struggle um, between painter and Lloyd, I wanted to be articulated in the branches of the trees. So some of the branches are about painter and some of them are Lloyd and I thought that would be um, an appropriate way to show that sort of um, entanglement. And with each painting, um, even though I'm moving forward with this um, sort of absurdist narrative, I'm also um, finding excuses to quote or even homage some painters or artists that, that I've been interested in historically. So it, it's an effort for me to have these conversations with the dead almost, um, or seances if, or whatever. Um, and here we have Torpedo Boy, who's the son of Painter and Lloyd, and he's sent down to protect these mounds from vegans, but as you've seen, Torpedo Boy isn't the most responsible of superheroes. And here he is having to pay a toll to get into the forest. And this is a piece called Too Late, where Torpedo Boy has arrived in front of this mound, but he's bleeding to death. And Torpedo Boy scooping up the mound meat and trying to putty it back onto his body. And he's crying and the tears are mixing with the mound meat and pooling up at the bottom of the painting. And here we have Torpedo Boy tries his darndest to stop an oozing mound meat. And this is a very monolithic painting. It's about 12 feet tall. Um, and it's a patchwork quilt of sorts. And I chose to uh, show this frenetic activity um, by uh, taking Torpedo Boy's arm or his hand as a module and dumbing it down to this yellow uh, form and just having it multiply and try and uh, scoop up and patch up these more mound meat type moments. And there's lots of splatter. So it kind of gave me an opportunity to maybe say have a conversation with Matisse, but um, Motherwell at the same time. The legend breathes his very first death breath. The legend attempts to put out his own fire of life. And this is a study for um, the life and death of number one. And this is the life and death of number one. And here we have the mound's um, fur evaporating from his body and the, the mound meat uh, melting away off of his bones. And he's returning to the forest and his skeleton is that of a tree. So that's a detail of that work. And here we have the, um, the mound skeleton sitting in the forest. Um, this is a large work called By and By. And all the animals in the forest and surrounding areas are coming to pay their last respects to this great creature.
Okay, and this is um, St. Sesum. So somewhere in the second era of veganism, there was a vegan priest named Sesum. And Sesum was, he was um, an obedient um, keeper of, the, uh, of Lloyd's covenant, the, um, the covenant of less. He didn't have any possessions. He meditated daily. He took his you know, yearly sacrament of one tofu block a year. And he was generally a good vegan. And uh, he was very inquisitive, but he uh, also thought differently than other vegans. He, he knew that there was something missing in vegan life, that there was something else that wasn't being told. He wasn't sure what it was, but he knew that everything wasn't so black and white. And Sesame went to sleep one night, and he... Um, painter visited him in a dream and she showed him a color and vegans they have no ability to see in color so he didn't know what this sensation was and he woke up very confused and every night or every other night he would go to sleep and receive a new message a new color and uh, one night he was visited by painter yet again and she showed him the full spectrum and it blew his mind he had an orgasmic experience, and he woke up crying, waving his arms. He had never seen anything so beautiful, and he was confused. And it was at that point that Painter appeared before him, and she said, I am Painter, and these sensations that are before you are colors. These are the sensations that have been withheld from vegan kind since the beginning of time. And she explained to Sesame that vegans and mounds were fathered by the same being, Homer Buckus, and that vegans were once human. And that vegans had to now try to regain their humanity and by befriending mounds and asking them for their mound meat um, in a very humane way, um, and using this mound meat in rituals, they would be able to see color. By taking hits of mound meat, they would see color, become color-abled, and this would be their sacrament, and they would become human again, eventually. So Sesame gathered up his eight disciples, who you see before you, and they started to preach this wayward message in the underworld. And here we have St. Sesame walking on a sea of mound meat. This is Das Blimt. This is a piece that's five by five feet called Sesame's Dream. And written out in the work is painter's address to Sesame. Behold, Sesame, I am painter, so on and so forth. And it reads all the way around the painting. <clears throat> this is Sesame's mission. And carved right out of the surface of this piece articulates um, um, what Sesame needed to do in order to kickstart this new religion. He had to travel into the forest, meet his first mound, and become friends with this mound. And here we have Sesame's chamber. Um, I had always wanted to um, show my paintings from the back because so much, as you saw before, happens on the backs of these works because I cut into them and stab them and um, they're just as much about what goes on there as the front. <clears throat> so this gave me an opportunity to create this room, um, Sesame's bedroom. So when you get inside you realize that, oh, it's sort of a um, pared down version of what's on the front of these works. And I wanted this whole experience to be uh, like sensation or sensory overload. <clears throat> I inherited my grandfather's furniture and I turned the dressers into speakers, which are pumping out um, Muzak versions of songs with colors in the title, Pink Panther, um, Little Red Corvette, so on and so forth. And each of these buckets is filled with Pepto-Bismol, the stand-in for mound meat and each one represents Sesame and his eight disciples. So there's this rich smell of medicine and uh, colors all around you and music 
and uh, this was a very exciting thing for me to realize. And here we have a piece called Cult Jam, where um, these vegans are reveling in this new, uh, um, I don't know, in their new guidance, in their new relig religion. <clears throat> and this gave me an opportunity to have conversations with um, Hieronymus Bosch, another of my favorite painters. And this is the first miracle machine that I'm going to show you. And um, a miracle machine is a piece of Asa texture. And Asa texture is a kind of architecture that was, um, that's made up of reconstituted uh, dead vegan bone material. And it was invented by a vegan scientist named Beto Wachow. And Beto was the most, the smartest vegan that ever lived. He had five brains. And um, he was brainwashed into being in the cult of color. Um, Beto was smart enough to know that vegans, they were better off living in the dark, that they didn't need this new um, uh, mission to become human. It's like, who wants to be human? It's better to be this way. But he was tricked into being in this, in this um, group. And while he was under his brainwashing, he created these miracle machines. And a miracle machine works by putting mound meat in one end and out the other end color blasts that are so bright um, happen that when vegans see this, they become converted automatically. <clears throat> so here we have a miracle machine that's powered by hundreds of little vegans sucking mound meat through straws. And this is um, painter coming down from the heavens to help humanely milk a mound so these vegans can get more mound meat for their rituals. And this is um, a miracle machine. Miracle machine number two, the vegan made egg spit. Miracle machine number four, the patented energy saver. Miracle machine number five, the Deblin technique at work. Miracle machine number six, craft master. Miracle machine number 11, musacrilege. The very middle of a sweet journey. Miracle machine number 14, the furnace that burned together goodness. Miracle machine number 13, good vegan. This is a miracle machine called beacon. Miracle machine number 19, the hand of glory. Las Luces, Luces, and Losses. Stone Prone. The Abysmal, Dismal, Baptismal. The Cult of Color. In the Blestian Room. The Blestian Room is a cave within a cave within a cave um, where these wayward thinking vegans hold their color um, rituals and experiments. This is aborted but beautiful. So this whole St. Sesame and the Cult of Color saga took me about seven years to complete. And somewhere in, I don't know, midway at the midway point i realized that the story had to start to ebb back towards darkness again like we start with darkness um, have a rising action and then there's a crescendo of color and then a falling action back to um to darkness again and this sort of happens when um the purest vegans catch wind of what's going on and start to track down these, um, these colorful, color-loving vegans. And 
so there was a sense of paranoia and fear in the underworld. And I, I thought to myself, how am I going to articulate this gradually and incrementally over the course of the next, you know, say three years? And I started to slowly but surely pull the color out of the work and it began to get stranger to me and um, more enigmatic and the nar narratives were harder to pin down. And I thought in doing so, I should also have a sense of hiding in the work. Like you're not seeing the full vegan, maybe you're just seeing their hand or their foot as they're escaping, or maybe their head peeking over behind a rock as if they're paranoid or scared of something. This is brisk bones befallen, morsel. Bound. Give them an inch, they'll take a foot. This is the third to the last big hurrah. I was excited after I finished this painting. It's, I don't know, about seven by nine feet. Um, but I had discovered the, the module of these arms and that I could do so much with these arms. They were emotive enough to for me to carry the whole weight or personality of the vegan itself. So what I did was build this new kind of architectural space uh, with these arms. And when I finished, it, I sat back and it began to remind me of a new kind of industrial revolution, some kind of weird bone revolution. And I could just, I could hear gears turning and um, hands slapping and things falling. March of the Ocelanterns. Quick fixing and color mixing. You're late. And here we have the Blestian Room show. Um, so you can see how the drawing interacts with the paintings. And I worked with Harlan and Weaver Press in New York uh, to create a, a suite of about 11 color etchings uh, called The Ossified, Theosified. Ossification is a process of becoming bone-like and theosophy, one um, definition, is um, a religion based in the spectrum of color. And it's also a play on words, theosified, theosified. Sesum. The Disciples. Symphony. I took the title of this one from my favorite television show as a child, The Incredible Hulk. Um, and when that show first aired, when the pilot aired, um, there was first a black screen with white words on it and it was a quote i don't know who it's from but um i really like it it was um, within each of us oft times dwells a mighty and raging fury the fountain aborted but beautiful this is vegan arm and this is a sculpture made um, of like a polyethylene uh, plastic uh, with a steel rod going down the middle of it, um, cantilevered off the wall, holding a string with a bucket of Pepto-Bismol at the end of it. And it hangs nine feet off the wall. Um, it's like, it's hard for me to believe in sculpture. Sculpture for me oftentimes is just the residue of some other action, and then I can believe in it or sculpture as drawing makes a lot of sense to me. So I just saw this one as a very efficient drawing, like one, two, and we're done. And there's a sort of magical balance to the whole thing. Like how, did, how is that working? And I, uh, that to me was the power of that piece. And so in 2000, I think it was 2004 or five, I can't remember, I was approached by Stephen Mills, who's the head choreographer at Ballet Austin. And Stephen wanted to work with a visual artist uh, using their vision to create um, 
a brand new original uh, dance work. And um, he was familiar with what I'd been doing and approached me um, specifically because of my interest in narration and my, my narrative. And he wanted to adapt um, some of my work to do this piece. And I was currently just beginning the whole St. Sesum saga. I had written most of it out. I kind of knew where things were gonna go, but hadn't really made um, the full breadth of the work, because this was very early on. But we used that early script that I had, which I used in my own studio, and used that as um, the script for the, um, for the piece. So it was, the piece is called St. Sesum, uh, what's called Cult of Color, Call to Color. And I designed all the, the sets and costumes and of course co-wrote it. And then we brought in Graham Reynolds, who's the composer, and he's worked in theater and in film, and he made um, an original score for the, for the piece. Here we have Painter. And so I'll use this moment here with this picture to talk about Beto Wachow, again, the vegan scientist. Uh, so at some point, the brainwashing, uh, he snaps out of it. And once he does, it unlocks some nature of his, of his being called the black brain. And when this happens, his skin goes from a white pallor to this jet black color, and he becomes somewhat evil. And he takes all of his miracle machines and he rewires them to become miracle machines. So instead of shooting out uh, color and colorful eggs, they shoot out these black eggs that then hatch and become darkness babies. And darkness babies' only reason for existing is to destroy color. So here's how we um, fast forward into this new um, dark age. And here's one of the backdrops um, for the work, um, which I made at the Fabric Workshop in Philadelphia as a collaboration with them. And here you get a sense of the scale of that. It's uh, 60 feet long and 20 feet tall. And it's all hand sewn. All of those um, trees are cut out of felt individually and then sewn to this other support, which itself is sewn together. So it was a really crazy undertaking and took um, many people working many hours to get it done. So after the ballet, um, I returned to my studio and I was ready to kill Sesam. I was completely done, been working with him for years and was ready to move on somehow. But I knew it would probably take me a couple of more years to get him out of my system. But by then I had, um, I wanted to give myself new kinds of assignments. Uh, it's like, how can I keep this project fresh for myself while also uh, moving on this trajectory of, of darkness? And um, so I took the module of the head, that vegan head, and isolated it. And here's a five by five foot canvas. And what I did was put that head right in the middle and I decided to make a series of eight to 10 paintings that the backgrounds and the space of the head and the space of the eyes each acted as paintings in and of themselves and opportunities for me to exploit or explore all these patterns and motifs that I had created over the years. So I literally went to my scraps or my mounds of material and started to applique or glue on different kinds of surfaces uh, and mixed and matched them in order to find new uh, emotive possibilities. Uh, sorry, I'll return to that one. This is called fear. I came to know these as the fear heads. This is fear. The calm. I read a happy place. Blue balled voice effects. Hello, hollow lullaby. A tippy head run. The crest of civil unrest. 
Give me my flowers while I yet live, version two. Mold. There's a detail of that piece. Duel by a bleeder. And here, the, here are those fear head paintings uh, installed at the gallery. And uh, behind it are the fear drops. Um, and after I stood back from this work, and this is about six months after the ballet had debuted and had run its course, um, I realized how I had gestated um, that experience, that three-year experience of making that piece was that I was now looking at the wall as stage and each painting as a dancer. Um, this is the first time that the painting itself became a character as opposed to the painting be, being a, spa a space for me to um, have characters interact. So this was a rather different uh, attitude for me and I feel like it's the jumping off point for the work that I'm doing now. And so this is from 2008. This is the meddler. Munch. This is Miracle Machine number um, 94, um, OK Bouquet Today. And I use that as a jumping off point to make this large work, uh, eight by eight feet. It's called Dissension and Dissension. And so actually, at the bottom of that work is a hand that I, I discovered that in this work. So I took that, I liked it so much that I wanted to make a large painting based on that one hand. So this is the bad promise with this uh, mound meat raining from the heavens going through these holes in the hand with this fractured background. And so from this piece, um, I was approached by uh, the Olympic Sculpture Park or the Seattle Art Museum and they wanted me to um, do a piece for their pavilion, which would be up for a couple of years. It just came down uh, the beginning of last month. Uh, so I worked with fabricators and we built this large hand, which is about 50 feet long. And it's made out of aluminum panels that hang from the ceiling. Uh, so once you get close enough to it, you can see that the panels are hanging at different points in space and underneath are these vitrines, that which are color-coded, and the community is encouraged to bring in their unrecyclable material, their plastic tops, to put inside of these, um, these vitrines. So at the end of the day, it was um, going to be sort of a measure of, um, I don't know, activity and a collaboration. Here's my studio back home with the color coffin in it. And here we have the color coffin um, in a gallery situation, a show called Work While It Is Day, for when night cometh no man can work. It's a show about, the, about death of sorts and uh, about mortality, uh, coming uh, to the end of something and the, the the potential for something new to happen from that. So this show was about me basically rediscovering my own mythology and, and um, I guess, repurposing those images. Here we have We Done All We Could and None of It's Good, which is the title of a museum show that I currently have traveling, which is at the Weatherspoon Art Museum right now in Greensboro. This is called Smoked. Mr. Mouth. And with, this, with these works, I'm sort of returning back to that original image I showed you, Frosty, this uh, self-portrait, psychological self-portrait. This is I Really Do Love Myself. Torpedo Boy and Heron Hazel. Unruly. It takes two. Man don't work, don't eat.
like a thief in the night, version one. Like a thief in the night, version two. You are what you meet. Feet. The Everlasting Arms, version one. The Everlasting Arms, version two. Hot Coals in Soul. This is a rather large painting. Um, and I used my uh, 10 years worth of collected odor eaters in this piece. <laughs> piece doesn't smell bad. Well, odor eaters actually work, by the way. Um, this is Campbell's Street Light. The Doorstop. This was an etching that I made um, in New York at Columbia University's Neiman Center uh, called Pull. And this was also part of that suite. Um, A tidy sum, merciless is he. And these are etchings that I made um, at um, University of South Florida's graphic studio we done all we could and none of it's good. Like a thief in the night. The night foot. And this is um, a combination etching, litho, and silk screen that I made um, at Mass Arts in Boston. And here are the, the most current drawings um, I don't really understand fully where they're going or where they've been or what they're up to. So bear with me, I'll just show you the images. This is, and then it all came back to me. All things known and nothing to own. And I'll show you a couple of public arts projects and we're almost done. This is um, at the Dallas Cowboys football stadium. It's a piece called From a Legend to a Choir. And I think it's the largest thing that I've ever made. It's 108 feet uh, by three stories tall. And this is at a children's hospital in, um, in Houston, uh, Herman Memorial Children's. And this is outside of the radiology unit. And I worked with RX Art. Um, it's an organization out of um, New York. And their whole mission is to work with artists to place um, pieces of art in, in hosp children's hospitals across the country and um, to promote the healing qualities of art. So um, this was actually one of the most uh, rewarding projects that I'd ever participated in. And this is a piece called High and High, which is in response to the one that you, I saw that you, I showed you earlier called By and By, where the mound is dead and all the animals are grieving. So I decided to create a, a prequel to that work called High and High, where all the animals are uh, in the forest and they're happy and they're saying hello to this mound who's still alive and he's happy and, um, and laughing. <coughs> oh, and this is um, Old Judd. And this is from a movie that I've recently come to love called Eaten Alive. And it was made by uh, Toby Hooper. I mean, most people know him for Texas Chainsaw, but this is a lesser known of his films, and I think it's even better and, and a lot stranger. It's a horror movie set in, the, uh, in East Texas, out in the woods, out in the middle of nowhere, and this guy, old Judd, he has a, 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 
a hotel out there called the Starlight. And one day he has this psychotic breakdown and um, he checks people in and they don't check out. He takes a, a Grim Reaper sickle to them and pushes them over the um, porch into a pond. And there's a giant crocodile in this pond that he had gotten from some illegal animal trader. And um, so there's no real rhyme or reason to the movie. It's just an excuse to show this crazy guy getting crazier and crazier. And, um, but there's these pockets in the, in the movie that are just, I think, beautiful, um, beautiful color. Um, and they, it's, it, it's less about this kind of American version of horror and more about like Italian horror or something, like Dario Argento or Fulci. Um, and also kind of dips into some like German stuff like Fassbender where they, these people check into the hotel and they seem to be crazier than Judd. And there are these moments and it never explains any of it. It's just this sort of psychological portrait of mankind um, out in the middle of nowhere. And <clears throat> there's, there's this actually one beautiful moment where Judd re re retreats to his office area and he's trying on different pairs of glasses, and he's uh, looking over his receipts, and uh, he starts to sing this song to himself. And I can't find any record of this song anywhere on the internet, or I think the actor, uh, is, um, Neville Brand is the actor's name, I think he made the song up or something, but it's beautiful. And it uh, goes, down, round, underground, standing round in the rain. Ain't got no ticket, ain't got no bag, still I'm waiting on the train. Thank you. I think it's very intentional. Um, I want the work, or early on, uh, back when I was an undergraduate, when I was figuring out what my relationship was to this you know, large, vast art landscape um, and the history of art, um, and the artist I was interested in, studying their biographies and how they got to the places that they got to, um, I realized they were just being true to themselves. And they weren't afraid to look stupid or talk in a vernacular that um, no one else necessarily spoke. And um, I think it was at that point, you know, I'd left home by, that, by then and uh, actually resented some of the things that I grew up around, like in this rural, you know, Paris, Texas, you know, rusty farm equipment and, you know, people speaking in drawls and whatnot. And I, um, you know, and I also grew up a, you know, a preacher's son. So is that the idea of the church was also something I was uh, reacting to. And, um, and I, I guess I started to focus maybe a little bit more on the bad things that I remembered. And um, I think something happened, some kind of switch where it's like, well, what would be special is to just make aware this kind of rough around the edges attitude, this um, beauty, that this charm that's, um, that comes out of um, the deep northeast Texas woods and, um, and the kind of, not just the beauty, but the, the, the stranger things, the enigmatic things, the things that I couldn't really explain, the, the folklore, if you will, the idea that people believe so heavily in these things, sometimes in very bad things, and in believing and doing so with this sort of uh, 
mob mentality or this, uh, they were able to will things to life. And, and I think it was those energies that I became fascinated with and this idea of willing something to life through the artist's hand. So I think it was at that point that um, I really started to look at visionary art. You know, I, have, I feel like I have all of these, you know, you know, I was trained academically in academia, but there was, I've had all of these alternative art trainings or uh, art schoolings. And one was just visiting visionary art artists and visionary art galleries and looking at how they made decisions, um, looking at the art of the insane, looking at art of people that were just normal people that couldn't, weren't trained. Uh, looking at bathroom walls. Like I get really excited going to truck stops and seeing what people have scrawled into the wall. And I, I actually have a huge archive of those, those kinds of images because um, to me, they're just as truthful as say, um, you know, the cave drawings of Lascaux, you know, France or um, an African sculpture uh, or something carved in the side of a, a, a vase. Just, it's like you're getting I always want to get to something essential. And I feel like even though some of the stuff that happened in the Deep South um, wasn't good, it's like, well, those people believed in it and it was the truth. So I want those things. I flatten those things actually out in the work and take the moral value out of it and say, this just is. This stuff happened. This stuff is all there. And um, the good, the bad, and the ugly all have to live together in this thing. So therefore, that offers us people a space. It's like, how, when you approach the work, who are you going to gravitate to? The hero? Are you going to go to the victim? Maybe it's the trees that are more interesting to you. The trees as a character. It's like everything is just as interesting as everything else. There's no hierarchy. Um, even in that, in the, in that, um, the Eaten Alive film, Old Judd, well, the thing he mutters to himself the most is, there ain't no distinctions after his crocodile eats, eats one of the little girl's dogs. He's, he's trying to explain to the parents, it's just a crocodile. He, he's, he's, in, he's in nature. Ain't no distinctions. He didn't eat anything. Ain't no distinctions. So I, I actually believe that. There's, I don't know. I try to remove the moral out of the work and just make stuff. And then it reveals things to me. Because if I try to impose too much, then then I'm not teaching myself and I'm not learning. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, well, it's very hard, it's hard for me to dictate how the work is going to age. Um, just over the past, whatever, 20 years of me dealing with my own work, I mean, that's something I'm obsessed with. I'm constantly going back to my old sketchbooks or my old works and going, so what did I do right back then? Or why is this thing still viable to me? And some things don't age as well. Um, both materially and, and conceptually. I'm like, okay, that's, that's the work of a young artist. And I feel like the work I'm doing now 
in 20 years will be the work of a young artist. That's what I'm going to look at and say. And I'm kind of excited about that kind of um, unfolding of uh, realization. But, but yeah, like you were saying, there was a moment where I, I, I attached myself to the idea of the hero and the, the myth and the archetype through Joseph Campbell or Jung or, you know, what have you. And, you, you know, it's like the Bible versus Star, War, Star Wars versus, um, I don't know, different kinds of fairy tales or folklores and myths. Um, that was a major realization for me that it's like, oh, we're all on this, this kind of journey. And, you know, if I just stick to those things that are universal and true to us all, then that will give these um, characters or images permanence and therefore immortality in a, in a way. And um, so, yeah, in 500 years, I don't know, but I definitely think of the work as, as time capsules. It's like, this is me now, but me engaging. It's me thinking about the present, like very intensely, about the future, but also the past, like that thing I was saying about art for me is just a way to have conversations with the dead. Like oftentimes I'm just, I'm more interested in talking to artists from past generations. And I never know which artists they're gonna come to the fore for me. Uh, it's only as of recently, like when the, the past, I don't know, month that Francis Bacon came to me. I'm like, oh shit, I never really, I always kind of liked Bacon, but it's like, oh, now he's really in my studio. And he's, it's like, oh, I gotta talk to this guy. And I remember when Matisse came to me. It's like I never understood him, but then he was there before me through my connection to, say, uh, textile and pattern. I'm like, oh, I get what he was trying to do. And, and that happens, when those epiphanies happen and those doors open and those characters walk through, that's the most exciting thing for me. And that's why I continue to make the work is, I mean, there's many reasons, but, um, I think it's, it's, it's that, it's, it's, um, it's a way to dialogue and just connect with themes across space and time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I uh, used to be more in the past, I think before people knew what I was up to and like it was more surprising. It's like, oh, what's he talking about, the vegan thing? Well, I mean, I really actually first took on the idea of the vegan, I think, well, for the reasons that I mentioned, because it was very immediate and I needed to feel, to get something out of my system. But the vegan stuck around because I needed a stand in for the Christian who I was like attacking, I was attacking my own youth I guess, and this truth that I was given growing up that was an only truth. And I was like, well, maybe there's some other truths. Um, I can still hold this one as a truth, but let me look for some other ones. But uh, you know, I grew up around some very preachy and dogmatic characters, and they, were, um, they forced their ideologies on me. So I was like, maybe the vegan can be a stand-in for, for those people. But also, I love absurdity. I just, I think the whole act of making art is absurd. Like, um, you mean I'm gonna, I get, there's this space for me. I think it's beautiful, but absurd. I get to go to a room every day and make marks on a wall while people are out there trying to cure cancer. I get to do this and people think it's important. That's absurd, um, but it's beautiful too. Um, and that's where the superhero comes in, because I, I think the artist has this responsibility. Like, if you're given that the space to do that, to think in any way that you want to think, and it's this coveted spot, then make good use of it. Um, it's like we have the opportunity or have the power to see through things, literally. We see through systems. We see the layers, the strata, and we can reconfigure those strata through the, the things we make. 
um, we can reform reality. It's a really amazing thing. And I think it's, you know, sometimes uh, <coughs> people take it for, for granted. But, yeah, this, the idea of the vegan is it's just to keep using it and to even say it, it's like, oh, that's absurd, you know. So, again, I became a vegan for about six months as a performance. And it was a performance called Good Vegan. And I wanted to be the best vegan I could possibly be. And I think I was, you know. I, I really wanted to see what it was all about, you know. If you, if you want to think of it this way, get into the mind of the enemy and, and see how they, how they do it. And I did it. And when I finished, I was fucking happy. I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, okay, I'm not, a, I'm not a vegan. I'm, I, I like the meat. I know that now. <laughs> uh, sir. came out of necessity but also came out of memory and um, you know I grew up my father was not only a, um, a minister but he was a carpenter and um, a black belt in karate so he was teaching karate around the house and doing all kinds of weird what I think of now as performance art just a weird dude and my mom's a teacher and a piano uh, she gave piano lessons and stuff but she also was obsessed with home decorating so I remember as a little kid we I'd always be in Sherwin-Williams with her, trying to find something to occupy myself, and I would just thumb through these huge books of wallpaper. And it really excited me, because there'd be you know, one pattern, but they would um, say, okay, this time the flowers are gonna be red, and the background is gonna be kind of a, a, a mauve. And then the next time, the, the same flowers are yellow, and the background is like a light sky blue. And it's like, oh, and then I turned it again, and it was like, whoa. And I, didn't, I don't know why I was excited about, by that then, and I couldn't talk about it. It was just something to keep me busy. But it was just as exciting as playing with toys. Uh, so that's, again, one of those things that I think I returned to as an adult. Uh, so I was remembering, oh, what did I like to do as a kid? Because the kid version of me, I knew he, all he did was um, <clears throat> what was truthful, because like he hadn't been polluted yet. So I, I it's like, as I would conversate with artists from the past, I would conversate with this young artist that was me. So it was this real kind of schizo thing, where um, there's these different versions of me, and I would go try and go talk to them, almost uh, with these out-of-body experiences. And luckily, I, like I said, I saved a lot of my drawings, and those were teaching tools. But <clears throat> I don't know, it's a real strange thing to talk about, but I knew there was something. I think also, you know, there's certain genders placed on, on things. And I was exploring, you know, sides of myself that was all about, okay, I played football for six years of my life, and what was this? I also always have a coach yelling at me in my head, but then there's this mothering kind of thing, and I associated that with textiles and pattern making or something and quilts because my grandmother would make quilts and I would sit on the floor and watch her do this thing but you know it made sense it's like so how can I incorporate all of these things whether they be deemed masculine or feminine in the work and I know it's all me I know I, I'm both black I'm white I'm everything else I'm Japanese I grew up watching a lot you know taking in a lot of uh, Japanese culture so that to me was a truth <clears throat> So I feel like we make these distinctions about class and race and you know what have you, and they're oftentimes quite arbitrary, especially for the artist. You can cross those boundaries and um, be the punk. You can just buck the system and be risky in ways that other people don't. Uh, they don't see it at first. You can really get under the skin and do things by shape-shifting, by becoming another gender, becoming another race. It's, I think it's rather exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you.